Well, more police are on campus today here at McEachern High School after a shooting yesterday left two people injured and another person arrested. Sunshine around 70 degrees outside right now, but over the weekend rain moves back in. We'll time it out. Schools, residents and business owners left without water and power after a water main break. What officials say happened next. And crews continue to try to clear a crash that occurred there on the I-75 southbound lanes right around the downtown connector where it meets on there on the northern tier of it. We're going to continue to keep you updated on how you can get around this and move through there smoothly for your evening commute. 11 Alive News at 4 p.m. starts now. Well, good afternoon and welcome to 11 Alive News at 4 o'clock. I'm Faith Jesse and I'm Jonathan Martin. First at four this afternoon, a teen is in police custody after a shooting yesterday in the parking lot of McEachern High School. Now, police say they're still searching for another person right now. 11 Alive's Molly Oak is live outside the high school campus tonight. So, Molly, anything we know about this person police are still looking for? Well, this morning, guys, police emphasize that this is still an active investigation. That's because they are still searching for a person who they say also pulled out a gun and started shooting, but say that person didn't hit anyone. I want you to look at your screen for video from yesterday. This is from the scene. Cop police say they arrested a 17-year-old shooter around midnight in Union City. Now, that teen is charged with two counts of aggravated assault and possession of a firearm on school property. Now, this is video from social media reportedly showing the shooting outside McEachern. Cobb County Police won't confirm its authenticity, but did tell us it is part of the investigation. The police chief says the 17 year old they arrested is from Powder Springs and was originally a witness to the fight before pulling out a gun and shooting two people, one in the arm and another in the leg. Now, police say both of those victims are expected to be OK. Notably, the victims were not McKitchen students, but had engaged in a physical altercation with McKitchen students. Now, police added just out of an abundance of caution and for people to feel safer. There are more police on campus today for both students and staff. They also added that if anyone has any information about what led up to that shooting or who that second shooter could be, go ahead and give police a call. Guys. Molly Oak live for us. Thanks so much. New details this afternoon about an incident at Maynard Jackson High School this morning. School officials say a student was hurt and taken to the hospital during an altercation involving several students around 845 this morning. Well, despite rumors of a gun being pulled, officials tell us no firearm was found there. They did find two knives, though, on one of the students, but they were not used during the altercation. The school remained on a lockdown, interior lockdown, meaning no moving around through classrooms for the remainder of of the day and all after school all after school activities have been canceled Atlanta Public Schools police are still investigating that incident and as a reminder whenever news breaks you can stay connected for the latest developments through the 11 alive news app scan that QR code there on your screen download it straight to your mobile device and it is free Within the last three hours, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis admitted to a personal relationship with an outside prosecutor she appointed to manage the election interference case against former President Donald Trump. In a 176-page court filing, Willis said she and Nathan Wade developed a relationship in 2022, but that there was no relationship prior to his appointment as special prosecutor. Willis denies any claims of misconduct and says there was no evidence that the relationship between her and Wade had prejudiced the case. We'll have more on this story, including one legal expert's take on the impact on the election interference case. That's coming up tonight at 6 o'clock. All right, but right now, let's bring the rest of our team here at 4 o'clock. Meteorologist Melissa Nord and Andrew Wilson here filling in for Crash Clark. So good to have you both here. Melissa, how's it looking as we head into this weekend? Isn't it just the most perfect it spring so like nice. day? Oh, yeah. So nice. we, we were at 70 this afternoon. Wow. Sunshine. I mean, this is one of those evenings where you want to take a walk in the mm -hmm. park after work or like enjoy a nice bed beverage outside, but that will not last for the whole weekend. Uh, so that's what we're focused on. I know it's sunny out there now, but I want to talk about the next kind of inconvenience to your outdoor plans, and that's going to be the storm system coming in here for the day on Sunday. So you notice here on the forecast radar or dry tomorrow afternoon, but as we head into Sunday morning, rain showers start pushing closer to West Georgia, and then as we get into Sunday afternoon, we're going to have some rain on top of parts of the metro area as well. So uh, some of us will see a very wet day Sunday. Others of us will not see a total washout. We'll talk more about that in about 15 minutes. Let's talk about this sunshine outside right now. We made it to
to 70 this afternoon, currently 69 in Atlanta. Nice little northwest breeze keeping that airflow going. We're still at 71 in Athens, upper 60s right near Marietta, Covington, Peachtree City is 68, and this evening, Mostly clear skies make for a really comfortable evening. We're in the upper 60s now. Sunset time this evening is 6.09 o'clock, and we will see temperatures falling back to the 60s through sunset and then 50s on the way for this evening. So enjoy the weather now. Tomorrow's not bad, but then rain moves in for Sunday. We'll talk more about all of that coming up in just a bit. Let's get a check on that Friday rush. How are things going, Andrew? Melissa, it's nice to see the nice weather out there because that helps people get home a little bit easier, right? But remember, keep it slow out there. Take a look out right now out around the city. We do have a crash that occurred on I-75 southbound right before it hits the downtown connector here. You see that traffic is still fairly slow through there. Crews were able to get the crash over to the shoulder. You still see it over here on the right as you come around the corner. Make sure you give those crews plenty of room as they try to get that scene completely cleared. But thankfully, again, they at least have it over on the shoulder. There's a bit of a closer look at it. We also have another crash that occurred on the I-285 southbound lanes here. That's on the on the west side. That's going to be south of the I-20 corridor. Here's a look at where it is. Again, it's going to be uh, right there around Camp Creek Parkway. We're going to continue to keep a close eye on that. Thankfully, traffic moving fairly smoothly through there still, though. John. All right, thank you so much, Andrew. Well, the man accused in a triple murder in Cobb County is pleading guilty to at least 16 charges in that case. Brian Roden is accused of shooting and killing three people at Pine Tree Country Golf, or Golf Course back in 2021. He faces three consecutive life sentences plus possible additional time. Also today, the man accused in a mass shooting targeting two Atlanta area spas filed a motion to take the death penalty off the table. Robert Aaron Long appeared in Fulton County Court this morning. He is charged with killing eight people in a mass shooting spree in 2021, targeting spas both in Atlanta and Ackworth. Long has already pleaded guilty to the case in Cherokee County, receiving a sentence of life in prison without parole. All right, right now we'll take a live look here, an update to some breaking news to a story we first brought to you live at noon. Crews are working to repair a water main break. This is in DeKalb County. It brought schools and businesses to a halt and also left residents without water and power for hours. We want to get straight out to 11 Alive's Latasha Givens, who has been covering this story throughout the day. She is joining us live from McClendon Drive and North Avenue. Latasha, you're near where this water main break happened. What's it looking like right now? That's right. Good afternoon, Faith and Jonathan. This water main break has been causing a lot of issues since this morning. Some residents and business owners have gone without power and water, and some schools either had to relocate their staff and students or close for the entire day. I'm going to step out of the way and show you a live look from the ground here. We know you just saw the chopper view. Here's what officials say happened around 630 this morning. Watershed management noticed a drop in water pressure and sent crews to the 800 block of McClendon. This is where it caused structure damage. These pictures show the aftermath of what gallons of water spewing on the road left behind. The trickle down effect is that a power line was impacted, so some residents lost power as well as businesses. There were five DeKalb County schools that had to relocate to other locations and all of Decatur City schools were closed for the day. At last check, Georgia Power says 176 customers remain without power, and officials tell us they're not able to get direct access to the area until the county crews stabilize the road. The break to the pipe has been isolated. We know where it is, um, and the water has been stopped in that area, and now we're waiting for Atlanta Gas and Georgia Power to finish up so that crews can make repairs. Right now, crews are working to cut down a tree they say is considered dangerous. The roots were uplifted as the water spewed onto the street. Coming up at 5, the questions we posed to the county about the number of water main breaks we've had over the past months. Faith and Jonathan, back to you. Los Hasha Gibbons live. Thanks so much. Still ahead here at 4, the border crisis continues to be a hot button issue. And some on social media are claiming President Biden could act with a simple executive order. Tonight, we're verifying that claim. And next, the bodies of three soldiers from Georgia killed in a Middle East drone strike are back in the U.S. tonight. More on their dignified transfer, which was observed by President Joe Biden. And you're looking at I-20 westbound in DeKalb County. This is going to be two lanes that are closed because of a crash. We'll help you get around this crash and help you get home for your Friday evening.
Welcome back to 11 Alive News here at 4 o'clock. The killing of three U.S. service members, all from Georgia, has been a shock since they died in a drone attack in Jordan. And today, all three are back here in the U.S. President and Mrs. Biden joined grieving families at Dover Air Force Base for the solemn ritual called a dignified transfer. Now, the ceremony has become relatively uncommon in recent years as the U.S. has withdrawn from conflicts abroad. The deaths of William Jerome Rivers, Kennedy Sanders and Brianna Moffitt were the first U.S. fatalities blamed on Iran-backed militia groups following the onset of the Israel-Hamas war in October. Also this, tonight Vince McMahon is now the focus of a federal investigation. NBC, NBC News rather, has now learned that the former CEO of the WWE is under criminal investigation as prosecutors try to determine if he broke federal law surrounding recent allegations of sex abuse and sex trafficking. Those allegations have been made public through the filing of recent lawsuits against him by a former employee. McMahon has denied the allegations against him. Now, there will be a lot more more on this investigation coming up later on NBC Nightly News. Well, the crisis on the U.S.-Mexico border continues tonight. This week, a child and three adults were trying to cross the Rio Grande River into Texas, and they got swept up in the strong current before members of the Texas Department of Public Safety were able to pull them into a boat and bring them to shore. Well, the Biden administration is pressuring Congress to pass a bipartisan border reform package, but some people on social media are claiming that the president could bypass Congress with an executive order. So can a president take executive action to close the border? Abby Larico is in tonight to verify. We turn to several sources here to verify, yes, but it's complicated. And it leaves a ton open to the actual applicability or the practicality of doing these things. The president has fairly broad authority over American borders, according to the National Immigration Law Center. President Donald Trump exercised that authority with several actions, including ordering construction of a wall along the Mexico border. And since his first day in office, President Biden has taken even more executive action related to the border, issuing enforcement guidance to the Department of Homeland Security and rolling back Trump era policies. Experts say policies built on presidential orders and rules have a much weaker foundation. It is does not come with the permanence of a federal law, which can only come from one branch of government, and that's Congress. You need to get have a bipartisan agreement to get serious reform through. Immigration policies often face challenges from states, humanitarian groups, and even other impacted countries. So if you don't have a piece of legislation that justifies what you're doing, you could easily find yourself in a situation where, where individual judges are throwing out what you're trying to do. And that's, of course, what happened to Donald Trump in a number of the things he tried to do. Something else to consider, a president's precedent. Presidents are constantly thinking about how will my opponents take this precedent that I'm setting and how much further will they take that against policy uh, outcomes, which I fundamentally disagree. In other words, President Biden has to consider if he successfully shuts the border down via executive action, what may future administrations do with that kind of power. With your Verify, I'm Abby Larico. Sunshine, it is plentiful. It's really like an early spring-like afternoon. We're looking at live at our camera in downtown Rome. At times, those flags have been blowing in that bit of a breeze. We've had some high-level cirrus clouds building in, but here around the metro, it's been blue skies from start to finish this afternoon. We're still in the upper 60s right now in Atlanta. Look at this. Out in Gwinnett County, Lawrenceville is 70. Monroe is 70, 68 in Fayetteville. And as we look at your weekend, it's not going to look that warm outside. Tomorrow, still not a bad day. A lot of sunshine will be up around 60 degrees in the afternoon, but this is one of those weekends that is a 50-50 weekend. 50% of it is amazing. 50% of it, really not so great. And here's why. Sunday is going to be cooler. It's going to be gusty, and we're going to have rain showers building in from this low pressure system that's going to track right along the Gulf of Mexico. Three things to know about Sunday. Number one, where's the rain most likely? That's going to be south and west in our area. Number two, the temperatures are going to be cooler. Highs are only going to be in the 40s. And then on top of that, we've got gusty winds throughout the day, especially in the afternoon. Some of those wind gusts could be 30, 35 miles per hour. So it's just going to be a really raw and wet day for a lot of us. Others of us with lower rain chances, it's going to be a breezy, cloudy, and chilly day, but you may not see as much in the way of rain. And I think this map shows the picture of what we're going to see Sunday pretty well. Rain chances, 
much higher south and west of Atlanta than what they're going to be up in northeast Georgia. Let me zoom in and show you some of these cities that are going to have likely rain on Sunday. South and west of the Atlanta area, Noonan, Peachtree City, out towards Franklin, the Grange, out towards Thomaston as well. Here in the heart of Atlanta, we got a 60% rain chance for Sunday. That'll be mainly during the afternoon. The north side of the metro through Lawrenceville, Buford, and out towards maybe Canton in a Woodstock area, about a 40% rain chance, and then very low rain chances up in northeast Georgia. So here's the forecast track showing we start off Sunday morning, clouds are building in, rain showers start to creep in from the south and west as we push through the morning hours. Then for the afternoon, that rain is pivoting right along this kind of I-75 to I-20 corridor. It's going to be a pretty sharp cutoff between who sees maybe a half inch of rain and who sees next to nothing. Dry air continues spilling in with that wedge of cool air from the northeast. So Sunday afternoon, there are rain showers here in the metro. Northeast Georgia mountains, cloudy, windy, and chilly outside. We head into the evening, still tracking those rain showers over Atlanta, but that moisture pivots out of here Monday morning, so rain showers taper off as we head for the morning into the afternoon. And this is the story of the rain. Look at this. Rainfall projections, zero. Blairsville, Clayton, Gainesville. But if you travel south of I-20, we have a lot of rain totals that might end up being around an inch. Outside right now, we're in the upper 60s still. Overnight tonight, mostly clear skies. We're going to start off seasonably chilly in the morning, upper 30s and low 40s. Tomorrow is a breezy day, not as warm as today, but overall pretty nice. We'll climb up by lunchtime to 53, then topping out around 60 in the afternoon. Northeast winds will keep us cooler than where we are today. Here's your seven day forecast tracking that rain moving in on Sunday with gusty winds clearing out early Monday into next week. Let's check on your drive on this Friday. How are things going, Andrew Wilson? Melissa, I wish the commute was as smooth as what the weather is doing right now, but we do have a couple of slowdowns out there, especially here on I-20 westbound. This is going to be right before you hit I-285 in DeKalb County. You see that the crash has uh, two lanes blocked actually right there, and it's uh, going to be uh, back up for quite some time. So you may want to go ahead and take Covington Highway and then make it all the way up to I-285, then head southbound, northbound, whichever direction you may need to head. Again, they still have multiple hero units there on the scene as they try to clear that accident. Another accident that's located right there on I-285 southbound before Camp Creek Parkway. We'll continue to keep a close eye on that, uh, that accident as well, but thankfully it looks like that accident not as serious. Andrew, thanks so much. OK, so this is the day the nation looks to an animal which gorges itself all summer and then sleeps through most of the winter, all to figure out when spring will arrive. Glad tidings on this Groundhog Day An early spring is on the way. So that was the proclamation being made early this morning by the inner circle at Gobbler's Knob. The most famous groundhog in the world, Punxsutawney Phil, emerged from his winter slumber. And after surveying the large crowd on hand, Phil let it be known that he did not see his shadow. So as for here in Georgia, Bo came out of his home at the Dawson Trails Nature Center in Butts County and said it will be an early spring, at least for us as well. And in case you're wondering which fuzzy forecaster is more accurate with predictions for the weather in our area, a recent analysis done by 538.com showed that Bo fared better than Phil. And if we're looking at today's weather, this just might be a preview of <laughs> yeah. an early spring, Melissa. It's nice, <laughs> but um, you know, Andrew, I would say that we're both more accurate than 70%. Yeah, I would say so as well. I, <laughs> I, think, agree. I, I, agree that. <laughs> I think we can, we can beat uh, the groundhog. You yeah. can trust yeah. your 11 to live storm trackers. I gotta <laughs> say that whole, it kind of felt like a tailgate. I've never seen that before. Maybe You've never seen oh. a Pakistani thing? No, I had oh, no idea. No, it's, it's a party. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's their one thing. event of the year. Wow. I want to okay. go next year. More to come here at four. Right now, there is a bill under the Gold Dome looking to reduce the amount of time for early voting here in Georgia by one week. Coming up, we'll look at where it sits in the legislature. And the question, how is everybody doing? It seems like a simple one, but Elmo found out it was a little complicated. Hear what Elmo is now saying coming up. You're watching 11 Alive News at 4. Well, the musical lineup for this Sunday's Grammys Awards is uh, one amazing concert lineup to be uh, frank here. Earlier this week, we told you that you too would be performing live in the show directly from Las Vegas. Now you can add Tracy Chapman. The singer has not performed in public in years and will return to the stage Sunday to perform, perform rather her iconic song 1988 hit Fast Car. It'll actually be a duet with Luke Combs, who's nominated in the Best Country Solo Performance category for his cover of Chapman's song. So Chapman 
Hamilton has performed for the cameras only three times since completing her last tour, which was in 2009. Well, it turns out that a fuzzy red puppet has opened the eyes of America to a grim truth, and it all started with a simple question. So the popular Sesame Street character Elmo took to X on Monday and said, Elmo is just checking in. How is everybody doing? Well, since then, the post has been viewed more than 200 million times. Safe to say the answers may not have been what Elmo was expecting. Celebrities, news outlets, and fellow Sesame Street characters all replied with answers with despair, dread, and exhaustion. Thousands of people chimed in with posts like, I'm depressed and broke. I'm at my lowest. Thanks for asking. Well, during an interview this week with CNN, Elmo explained why it's so important to check in with friends. You know, Elmo's not really sure. Elmo was surprised because Elmo didn't realize that when you ask someone how they're doing, you have to be ready because maybe someone's not doing well or maybe somebody is. But uh, it's an important question to ask, and um, I almost learned a lot about that. Well, because of the overwhelming response, Sesame Street actually shared some mental health resources on their website. Yeah. And while it's Elmo, it may be a little funny there. It's really a serious situation where I think we all can check in with our friends, our coworkers, everyone. That's yeah. so important because even if you smile and say, oh, good morning every single day, you have no idea what people are dealing with at home mm -hmm. or even in their own minds. Yeah, and taking interest in the people around you's lives. Uh, so important there. And, you know, Elmo's still taking care of us even as adults, right? Yeah, yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it, too. All right, Friday traffic. <laughs> yeah, it's busy out there. We have a few incidents that we're keeping a close eye on. I want to get right to it. Let's take a look over on I-20. This is going to be in the westbound lanes over by uh, I-25 there in DeKalb, um, in DeKalb County. We still have two lanes closed. So the westbound lane's very close. You want to maybe head out uh, Covington Highway to avoid some of this. Another crash, this one just coming into our system, is going to be uh, over towards Thornton uh, Drive there. We have an overturned vehicle. We'll have a latest update on this coming up in just a moment. And sunshine's been plentiful outside today, but for the whole weekend, I cannot say the same. We're tracking a soggy finish to it, a windy and colder finish to it. We'll time that out next at 430. First at four, a lot of sunshine outside right now, but <laughs> Before you get to those weekend plans, you need to see this. We've got rain moving in for some of us, a very soggy finish to the weekend. And it's a big election year here in Georgia. Right now, a bill being considered at the Capitol would shorten the time frame for early voting by one week. Also, the world of AI may soon change how you shop and get around town. And you want to eat oysters, need to take care of your toddler, and want to see a Broadway show? Well, you can do it all this weekend right here in Atlanta. We'll set you up with our weekend watch. Welcome back to 11 Alive News at 4 on this Friday. I'm Jonathan Martin. And I'm Faith Jesse. So if you've had a chance to get outside today, we know that you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Right now, we are still basking in plenty of sunshine and rather spring-like temperatures here in February, but that is going to change. That's right. Let's bring back meteorologist Melissa Nord. So, Melissa, you're looking at a chance of rain for this weekend as well. And for some of us, that finish of the weekend is just going to be raw, damp, and wet outside. Storm system cutting across the southern, uh, the, the, the kind of Gulf of Mexico coastline. This is going to send some rain in our area for Sunday, but who sees that rain will widen widely vary based on where you are. Rain is going to be likely south and west of Atlanta. Here in Atlanta, it's about a 60% rain chance for Sunday, but up in the North Georgia mountains, that rain chance is only 20%. So that's a snapshot of what's on the way for Sunday. But outside right now, that blue sky, it has been beautiful. We made it to 70 this afternoon. We're still at 69 here in Atlanta. We've got a lot of upper 60s on the map right now. And this evening, temperatures are going to be falling back slowly into the 50s by 7 o'clock and low 50s by 9 o'clock. We'll talk about a nice day tomorrow. Time that rain out hour by hour in just a bit. Let's get a check on your Friday commute. How are things going, Andrew Wilson? Oh, it's busy out there, Melissa. A lot of people out there on the roadways here for this Friday evening commute, taking a look out towards I-20 westbound again, right before I-285. I keep coming back here because I want to really let you know, I mean, they're going to have this shut down for a little bit of time here. Notice that those lanes still close. They've got the cones out to hero, hero units as they work that crash. Try to move around this using Covington Highway. Now, we have another crash that I talked about earlier. I want to give you a closer look at it. This is going to be a wreck at the intersection of Thornton Road and Douglas Hill Road. It's kind of blocked the intersection. You see that there is a car flipped over. Crews out there working on the scene, even an ambulance there working. We'll keep a close eye on that. Get around that by taking Six Flags Road down to Riverside Parkway. Jonathan? Andrew, thanks so much. A bill just introduced in the state Senate which shortened early voting periods. And voting right activists say that this is a voter suppression bill. 11 Alive's Doug Richards is live at an early voting site with what we know here, Doug. 
Yeah, you know what? Uh, we were learning today that time flies a little bit. Uh, the, the early voting for the presidential preference primary, that March primary, actually starts in just 17 days at here and locations all across the state. Senate Bill 443 uh, would change the window for the early voting, causing it to start two days later and end two days sooner. You look back to just a few years ago, we had no early voting. Republican Rick Williams says too much early voting wastes time of election workers and the money of taxpayers, especially in smaller counties. Even 21 days, they're sitting there and nobody even comes in to vote on several days. So it's a waste of money. Senator Williams introduced a bill that could change early voting for the November election. It's currently due to start Tuesday, October 15th, and conclude Friday, November 1st. This bill would eliminate the first two and last two days, killing 30 percent of early voting in most counties, says Helen Butler, a voting activist. Reducing 30 percent of the early voting time will really create much longer lines. It would be a nightmare for election officials because election officials really love early voting because it, it allows them to do their work. Butler says most voters prefer early voting to voting on Election Day. She says more early voting thins out crowds and helps voters manage their time. And to me, early voting meets everyone's need. And I need to correct the bill number. I said Senate Bill 443. It's actually Senate Bill 446. I never use bill numbers on TV, and that's at least part of the reason why. Um, the bill does have a lot of Republican co-sponsors. One of them is the chairman of the committee that usually does election bills. So uh, this bill has a chance uh, to at least get some love in the Senate uh, before the end of this session. We are live in DeKalb County. Back to you. All right, Doug, we appreciate it as always. This month marks one year since a UGA doctoral student was killed in a head-on crash. And right now there is a higher reward to help find the man who hit her. Beth Buchanan and her mom were on the way to the Atlanta airport when the crash happened in Winder. Now she was in the second year of her PhD program at UGA. The Barrow County Sheriff's Office is now offering $10,000 for information leading to the arrest of Cesar Rodales Macias. He's wanted for first degree vehicular homicide. And happening tomorrow, DeKalb County is hosting its second Medicaid re-enrollment event to help residents retain essential health insurance. This is a free event taking place from 9 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon on Turner Hill Road in Stonecrest. That is where that former Sam's Club used to be. Anyone wishing to re-enroll during this event is asked to pre-register on the website. You see that website right there at the bottom of your screen. Well, next Wednesday is National Girls and Women's Day in sports. But this morning, the College Park Skyhawks wanted to get in a little early on the spirit. So the NBA G League team hosted a youth basketball clinic for 60 girls at West Clayton Elementary School. Not only were there lessons in dribbling, shooting, and passing on the basketball court, but it was also meant to serve as a way to empower these young girls through sports. You know, basketball is a really amazing sport. It teaches you a lot of lessons on and off the court that you can carry with you for your life. And we're ready to instill those in girls at a young age. Everyone who came out and took part in the clinic also got two tickets to the Skyhawks home game, which is next Saturday night against the Delaware Blue Coats. Oh, and great seeing those young yes. ladies there and seeing that they can look up to young women in their community who have really excelled at the sport that they perhaps aspire to do. And I like what she said, life lessons on and off the court mm -hmm. and they actually get to go watch a game. Yeah, I we love, love it. it. We might be talking about them on the news one day. Okay, coming up here, 2024 is starting off with solid numbers in the workforce. Find out how many more new jobs are being filled. Also coming up here at four, it may be a while before we know if Donald Trump is guilty of committing financial fraud in the state of New York. We have a, red, a lot of red on spots on this map. You look over towards I-20 in those westbound lanes towards I-285. Crews still working that accident. Really try to uh, slow down as you pass these emergency vehicles. We'll help you get around all this and get you home for Friday coming up. Well, welcome back. Let's talk about a couple of consumer stories out tonight tied to the growing use of artificial intelligence within two major companies. The first up is Amazon. They are launching a new generative AI shopping assistant. This assistant is named Rufus. The company is hoping it'll eventually serve as a one-stop shop 
for a shopper's needs. And Rufus will be trained to answer questions such as what to consider when buying running shoes and also respond to follow-up questions. For now, it is only available to a limited number of Amazon customers. And Google is also adding generative AI to its maps. This feature will allow you to speak to the app and help you find new places where you live or throughout the country. And you can further refine the search results by asking follow-up questions as well. Google says the system will work no matter how specific or broad your needs might be. And right now, that feature is only available for certain areas and select local guide members. Right now, breaking just into our newsroom, we are learning the U.S. has launched attacks in Iraq and Syria. The Department of Defense says it is the first retaliatory strikes for the killing of those three Georgia soldiers in Jordan. This is part of the U.S.'s efforts to slow down the growing threat from Iran-backed groups across the Middle East. We'll have much more on that coming up at 5 as well. Well, tonight we have learned that the economy kicked off 2024 with a bang. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports the U.S. added a stunning 353,000 jobs in January. So this is a stronger than expected gain to kick off the year. Also, the unemployment rate remained at 3.7 from the month before. This marks the 24th month in a row that the nation's jobless rate has remained under 4%. A verdict in New York's civil fraud case against Donald Trump may now be delayed by a few weeks. The judge overseeing the case has aimed to deliver a ruling in the case by the end of January, but now it is aiming for early mid-February. Now that that date has passed, New York's attorney general has said Trump, his two adult sons, and his company should pay $370 million in disgorgement for their ill-gotten gains. The judge says the new timeline is still a rough estimate and is subject to being modified. Well, coming up here, is an Atlanta VA employee the victim of unfair pay deductions, or is there a case for him to be classified as AWOL? We're investigating that claim coming up next at 4. And I know you're probably enjoying all the sunshine, the warm temperatures that we have out there right now on our Friday, but this weekend, we are tracking the next rainmaker. For some of us, the weekend finishes with a washout. We'll talk about that next in your forecast. Well, new at four, an employee at the Atlanta VA Medical Center turned to 11 Alive after he says his pay has been unfairly docked for more than a year. And our Bobeth Yates spoke with the employee and the VA with the goal of getting some answers. Only way you can be AWOL if I have left and went to North Dakota Mall up the street and I'm sitting there shopping when I'm supposed to be at work. That's AWOL because you're not on the property. Not when you own the property and you're working. Maurice Robertson, a pharmacy tech at the Atlanta VA, is fed up that he consistently works a 40-hour week, yet his paycheck doesn't reflect it. You might be on a call, it might jump off and say something else. They'll use that to try to say you're not doing your duties. You're in the restroom using the bathroom. They'll use that to say you're not at your desk. Robertson says the reasons used to dock his pay and consider him absent or AWOL are endless. So with his help, we pulled his pay stub and confirmed AWOL is listed over and over. The VA has a, what you call a leave and attendance system, meaning if you have time, you use your time. Let's say you might have accumulated 300 hours over a year. If you're running late, put your time in, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, put your time in. Then the only way they're supposed to use leave without pay is when you have used all your leave and attendance time. While examining Robertson's pay stubs, we notice he had more than 100 hours of available leave time. Yet he says he's listed as AWOL for various reasons, and his pay is deducted instead of his leave being used. 11 Alive reached out to the VA for comment, and they sent us a statement that reads in part, the Atlanta VA healthcare system takes employees' concerns seriously and encourage our employees to raise any concern. The statement went on to say they've contacted to the employee directly about his specific issue and could not share any additional details with us. But Robinson says he's filed multiple internal complaints. In the meantime, he says not receiving his full paycheck has drastically impacted his life as expenses pile up. In fact, the day of our interview, his car broke down. Pulley pop. Once again, if I had my money, possibly gonna have some money out here right now. Bo Beth Yates, 11 Alive News. Well, the job market might look solid on paper, but active job seekers say the labor market feels more difficult than ever. Our Jennifer Bellamy is here with more on that and other stories we're working on for the News at Five. Jonathan, a new survey found that more than half of unemployed adults are burned out from searching for a new job. We'll explain why tonight at five. 
It's like kudzu in the water. Coming up at 5, residents say they're not going to let an invasive species choke their economy and erode their lake. I'll tell you what they're doing to save it. Plus, brides without wedding dresses just before their big day are getting some support. How two local women are helping brides get the wedding dresses of their dreams. Those stories and much more will we see you tonight at 5. Sunshine has been so nice to see today, and those temperatures bumped all the way up to 70 degrees in Atlanta. But I unfortunately want to focus on the not so nice weather coming in because this is going to be more than a nuisance for some of us on Sunday. It's going to be a storm system tracking across the Gulf Coast, and meanwhile, it'll spread rain north into our area. And on top of that, gusty northeast winds are going to be with us throughout the day on Sunday. So the three bullet points that you really need to know about. Number one, the rain. Who's going to see the rain? We'll time it out coming up. Number two, the temperatures. We hit 70 today. We're in the 60s tomorrow. It's going to be a lot colder on Sunday. Highs are only going to be in the 40s, so we're right back into that winter-like weather. And number three, the winds. At times, the wind gusts on Sunday could top over 30 miles per hour. So we're really going from the best of the best to the not so nicest of the not so nicest in terms of weather in a matter of 48 hours. Chance of rain on Sunday widely varies depending on where you are. We're going to have a really sharp kind of demarcation line difference between who sees a very cloudy day and who sees a very wet day. We'll start off south and west of Atlanta and zoom in. You can see the areas from Peachtree City down to Jackson, down into LaGrange, Meriwether County. We're going to see rain likely during the day on Sunday. So there do not make outdoor plans. Now here in Atlanta, the whole day is not going to be a washout, but especially in the afternoon, we have a lot of rain showers pivoting through the metro. So your rain chance is about 60% here from the heart of Atlanta through to Cobb County, Cobb County, and up 400 into Roswell. As we travel to the north side of the metro, further up into Cumming, Buford, Lawrenceville, rain chance is about 40%. And then for the mountains, your Sunday looks mostly dry. Here's the forecast track, which shows that rain. First thing Sunday morning, still south and west of our area, but it's creeping in during the morning hours and then for the afternoon, kind of hovering on this I-75 to I-20 corridor. So rain showers move in. If you start to see the rain moving in on Sunday, it might rain for a while for you. Here we go Sunday afternoon to the evening. You can see rain still coming down here in Atlanta, DeKalb County, Marietta area. And then by Sunday evening, that rain starts to pivot back to the south. So Monday, those showers are tapering off and some hints of sunshine at least come back for Monday afternoon. So if you're south of I-20, you might get a half inch to an inch of rain. But meanwhile, up in northeast Georgia, not a drop hardly. All right, so we talked about the rain. The winds will be a huge factor throughout the day. Look at some of these gusts. They're going to be around 30 to 35 miles per hour, continuing to gust even higher than that overnight and into Monday morning. And then temperatures, that was the third thing to know, a lot cooler. Highs on Sunday, 10 degrees below average in the 40s. Outside right now, we've got sunshine currently in Atlanta. It's still 69 degrees. Tomorrow morning, Clear start, good morning for a walk into the afternoon, climbing up to highs in the low 60s and upper 50s. It's going to be a breezy day tomorrow, a little cooler than today, but pretty nice outside overall. Here's your seven day forecast showing those rain showers moving through for Sunday, clearing out early Monday, and then those temperatures respond nicely to that. We'll be climbing back into the 60s starting on Wednesday. Andrew. Melissa, we'll take that nice Saturday. Hey, with the nice weather, make sure that you're looking twice for those motorcycle riders out there. Let's take a look at traffic right now for this evening. Again, still dealing with a big slowdown. This is I-20 westbound right at I-285 there in DeKalb County. You see the backup still pretty serious there. Two right lanes are blocked. They are going to be there for a while. Take Covington Highway to get around that. We have another crash. This one's going to be right there at uh, Thornton Road and Douglas Hill Road right at that intersection. They have two tow trucks that just arrived on the scene trying to upright the vehicle that was flipped. It looks like they just got it uprighted, and they're going to try to pull those out of there and get that intersection back open. Jonathan. Andrew, thanks for that update. You know, we are heading into the weekend, and there are a lot of events happening around the Atlanta area as we also kick off the month of February. So it is time for your weekend watch. Let's get into it. First up, a seafood takeover in Midtown this weekend. The Atlanta Oyster Fest is taking place Saturday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at Atlantic Station. A ticket includes all-you-can-eat oysters, alcohol, a souvenir cup, and live entertainment tickets are $50 ahead of time or 60 bucks at the door. Also, don't throw away your shot to see Hamilton. The Broadway hit is back in Atlanta through February 25th with shows almost every day. Tickets start at 40 bucks. 
And here's a fun outing for families with younger kids. The Hyatt Museum of Art is hosting its monthly Toddler Saturdays event this weekend. It's designed for children ages 15 months through three years and their caregivers. There will be art making activities and self-guided tours. Sounds like a lot of fun for the kids there. For more details on these events, all you have to do is text Weekend Watch to the number on your screen. We will send you a link with all of the information straight to your phone and hope you'll have a great weekend. All right, there are two bills moving through the Georgia legislature that could restrict which books are allowed in libraries. We'll break down the proposals when we come back on 11 Alive News at 4. Right now, Georgia lawmakers are considering changes that could impact the next trip to the library for you and your children. Two separate proposals are working their way right now through the state Senate, and one calls for a closer scrutiny of books available at public libraries. The other is taking aim at the people who run the libraries. 11 Alive's Jerry Carnes has the details. First came the debate over book bans. Now, some Georgia lawmakers want an even closer examination of the books available at public libraries and the people who make them available. These bills are an attack on our children's civil liberties and they seek to limit our kids' identities. Senate Bill 394 would require ratings for certain books that would indicate if they included, quote, sexually explicit material. It would also block school districts from purchasing books from any company that doesn't provide such a rating. Recent library bans have taken aim at books that tackle LGBTQ issues. Rhonda Thomas of the group Truth in Education supports the proposal. This type of information be given to these young people can cause behavioral issues. This is not removing those books from them. These books can be found anywhere, but they are not appropriate in K-12 library. Another proposal would cut funding to programs tied to the American Library Association, the only group that can accredit librarians in Georgia. Supporters say the ALA uses its certification to push, quote, Marxist political beliefs. Decatur High School sophomore Nia Batra fears it will all lead to the elimination of books that helped her through childhood. I'm Asian and queer myself. I really needed those books growing up. Those books are going to be the first that educators take off the shelves. In a statement, the American Library Association says it will remain committed to assuring, quote, free and unfettered access to a wide range of information. That was Jerry Carnes reporting, and state senators haven't yet taken a vote on either bill, but if it is all approved, those changes could take effect next July. Well, coming up next on 11 Alive News at 5, law enforcement in Cobb County now focused on making sure students feel safe following a shooting at a high school yesterday. Plus, schools in DeKalb County disrupted because of a major water main break. Where repairs stand, next on 11 Alive News at 5.